In this lecture, we're going to look at Green's theorem for flux. So previously we saw what I call Green's theorem. You could also think of that as Green's theorem for circulation. This statement here is a little bit different, but I'll show you at the end how it actually follows from Green's theorem for circulation. So for this theorem, we assume that D is a closed bounded region in the xy plane whose boundary C consists of finitely many piecewise continuously differentiable curves which are positively oriented. Once again, that means that if you're driving around C, the region D is on your left. For this statement, let N be the unit normal vector along C, which we want to point outward from the region D. So here I've sketched a sample domain. So the shaded region is D. It has two boundary curves, one that goes around the edge, and then the circle in the middle. Both of these curves have been positively oriented so that if you drive around them, D is on the left. And then here I've visualized three examples of this unit normal vector, which we would imagine pointing out of every point along each boundary curve in a way that points outward from D. Okay, back to the statement of the theorem. If F is a vector field on R2, which is a nice continuously differentiable vector field, then the circulation integral f dot n ds, which is really a flux integral, is equal to double integrating the divergence of f across the domain d. So the integral on the left is really measuring the flux outward across the boundary of d. And we're saying that that's equal to adding up all of the expansion across D. That should make sense. So if this was a fluid in the plane, how much flows across the boundary curve in the outward direction should be equal to the general expansion in the domain. So if we have positive flux out, we would expect expansion. If we have flux inward, then we would expect contraction. We have this unit normal vector field pointing out of the boundary curve that I haven't used in lecture yet, so let me just make a quick remark about how you can find that. So if we were setting up, say, the integral on the left, we would need a parametrization. That's our first step, to parametrize our boundary curve or boundary curves with descriptions of the form r of t equals the x-coordinate comma the y-coordinate. If you compute the velocity vector r prime of t, Written in this way, that would be x prime of t comma y prime of t. To get the unit normal in, you switch the coordinates and negate the second one. And then to make sure it's an actual unit vector, you divide that by the speed, the length of the velocity vector. Just by construction, this is unit length. And then you can also check that by construction, it's orthogonal to the boundary curve because the dot product of r prime and n would be zero. You would have 1 over the speed times x prime y prime minus x prime y prime. So that would cancel out to 0. This is always the form of that unit normal. And the reason why is because the region is on the left. So whether we're traveling around, say, an interior boundary or the exterior boundary, if we zoomed in, so here imagine that this continues, but I'm really zooming in on the boundary curve so that I don't even know if this is an interior or exterior boundary. Here's the parametrization, it's kind of going up and to the left. Here's the velocity vector r prime. You would need to rotate by 90 degrees clockwise in any situation in order to get this unit normal. And this vector I've put down here is the equivalent of that clockwise rotation by 90 degrees. Let's compute both sides of Green's theorem for flux for this example. It's going to be a large calculation. I think I'll need a couple pages. Here, D is a region in the first quadrant that looks like a quarter disk of radius 4. So D has a boundary curve, which we will describe with three pieces, one that goes along the x-axis, one that goes along the, the circle, and then one that comes down the y-axis. Let f be the vector field f of x and y equals x comma y minus x. We'll compute both sides of Green's theorem for flux. What I want to do on this page is set up the left-hand side, which is that flux integral around the boundary. Okay, so let's call this c1, 
notice its outward pointing unit normal vector is always just going to point one unit down. So that's actually a very easy vector to describe. It's always going to be 0, negative 1. Let C2 be a piece of the circle of radius 4. Its unit normal is going to need to point out like this. That will change point by point as we travel along C2. And then to finish C, let C3 be this piece coming down the y-axis. Like C1, it also has an easy to describe outward pointing unit vector. Its unit normal vector pointing out would always have the form negative 1, 0. Okay, I'm going to parametrize them in the indicated directions so that as we drive around this boundary, we're consistently oriented so that the region we're enclosing is on the left. The first step in any of these line and surface integrals is to parametrize what you're trying to integrate over. So in this case, we're trying to integrate over this boundary curve, so we're going to have to parametrize C1, C2, and C3. We'll do these individually. For C1, let's call its parametrization R1. And we just need to go from the origin to 4, 0. So I'll parametrize that as R1 of t equals 4t comma 0, since the y-coordinate is always 0. And then set up this way, t goes from 0 to 1. The velocity vector is r1 prime, which is 4, 0. So the speed of that curve is a constant 4. And again, you could actually use the formula I gave you for that unit normal vector, or you can just recognize that that's always going to point one unit down. So that's 0, negative 1. OK, I think that's everything we need for that first boundary curve. Let's go on to C2. C2 is part of the circle of radius 4, so we'll parametrize that as 4 cosine t for sine t, but we only need the part in the first quadrant, so t is going to go from 0 to pi over 2. The velocity vector is negative 4 sine t or cosine t, whose length is 4, so the speed of this parametrization is 4. This time, if we use the formula for that unit normal, we switch these coordinates. We would have 4 cosine t, negative 4 sine t, but you negate the second one, so that's 4 cosine t, 4 sine t divided by 4, leaves us with cosine t sine t. So that describes the outward pointing unit normal vector along C2. Let's move on to C3. For C3, you could parametrize it just by inspection. So you could figure out how to get from 0, 4 to 0, 0, where you make sure that you travel down. Here, I'm actually using that formula to parametrize a line segment. So it's 1 minus t times where we start, plus t times where we end. And when you crunch those numbers, you get 0, 4 minus 4t. And parametrize this way, t goes from 0 to 1. Note that would also work to parametrize c1 if you didn't see that parametrization. So for any line segment, it's 1 minus t times where you start, plus t times where you end. t goes from 0 to 1. The velocity vector is 0, negative 4. That has a constant speed of 4. And once again, you could use the formula for little n, or you could just realize that the outward pointing unit normal vector goes 1 unit to the left. So that's negative 1, 0. We're not going to have room to finish the calculation on this page, so we'll go to a second page. But how do we calculate this flux across the boundary? Well, we're going to do it with three pieces. So we'll do the flux across C1 plus the flux across C2 plus the flux across C3. For each one of those, we'll use the appropriate description of the outward pointing unit normal vector. So let's go ahead and fit that on this slide. For the first curve, we take r1 of t, so that's 4t0, and plug it into f. That gives us the x-coordinate y minus the x-coordinate. So overall, that's 4t comma 0 minus 4t, so that's f of r1. Dot, that normal vector is just 0, negative 1, times the speed dt. This is just a scalar line integral where the scalar function that we're integrating is f dot n1. So basically, you evaluate that on your parametrization times the speed dt. It's just a regular scalar surface integral at this point. And then the bounds on t go from 0 to 1. For the second one, we're going to integrate from 0 to pi over 2, f along that boundary curve. So f along the circle of radius 4 is going to be 4 cosine t. And then y minus x is 4 sine t minus 4 cosine t dot that unit normal vector, which was cosine t sine t, times the speed dt. Once again, that's 4 dt. 
And then along the third boundary curve, C3, once again, we're going to integrate from 0 to 1. F of our 3 looks like 0, 4 minus 4t. X is a constant 0 along that curve. Dot, the normal vector is easy to describe. It's negative 1, 0 times the speed, which is 4 dt. Notice this third one, we have a zero in the first component and a zero in the second component. We're going to take a dot product, so that's actually going to be zero. So that whole third piece gives us zero, zero flux. For the first one, we take the dot product, we also multiply by four, that's going to give us 16t. So we'll integrate from zero to one, 16t dt. And then for the second one, we'll take a dot product, we'll have terms that look like four cosine squared plus four sine squared minus four cosine sine, and then all that times four integrated from zero to pi over two. Okay, so let's do that on a new page. After simplification, this is where we left off with our boundary computation. So we were computing the flux of this vector field across the boundary of this enclosed quarter disk. Along C1, the integral simplified to integrating from zero to one, 16 t dt. And then for the second piece of our boundary, we're going to integrate from 0 to pi over 2, 16 cosine squared plus 16 sine squared. We recognize that that's going to be 16. Minus 16 cosine t sine t dt. To integrate that, we'll use u substitution. We'll let u equal cosine t so that du is negative sine t dt. We'll just integrate that with u substitution. Okay, so this is what we're left with. The antiderivative of 16t with respect to t is 8t squared. We'll evaluate that at 1 and 0. And if we integrate 16 with respect to t from 0 to pi over 2, that's going to be 16 times pi over 2. And then plus, what happens with our u substitution? Negative 16 cosine t sine t dt turns into 16u du. When t is 0, u is cosine of 0, which is 1. And when t is pi over 2, u is cosine pi over 2, which is 0. Okay, so let's start evaluating this. For the first part, we get 8 minus 0. For the second part, we get 8 pi. And then just for fun, I chose to flip my bounds and pick up a negative. Then we'll integrate from 0 to 1, 16 u du, and subtract that off what we got. Okay, so that's 8 plus 8 pi plus 8 u squared. Evaluate at 1 and 0. That's going to cancel out that first 8, so we're left with 8 pi. Okay, so if f represents some fluid in the plane, the total flux across the boundary of d is 8 pi. So we get the feeling that fluid is traveling across the boundary. Okay, let's compute the second part. We want to take the divergence of this vector field and double integrate it over the quarter disk. I set this up to be easy, so it's not always this simple, but the divergence of f is just 1 plus 1 which means that the double integral over d is going to be twice the area of d. It's a quarter disk, so that's 2 times a quarter pi r squared, and we get 8 pi. As expected, those two answers are the same. Let's finish today by relating the two Green's theorems that we've seen. So there's what I think of as Green's theorem, which is really Green's theorem for circulation. I claim here that that implies Green's theorem for flux. So if we already know the theorem for circulation, and from that we can derive the theorem for flux. To see that, suppose f is a vector field whose component functions are p and q. This is a vector field in R2. And let c, the boundary curve of the region d, as mentioned in the theorem, let c be parametrized by r of t for t values going from a to b. I would like to show that this flux computation is equal to the divergence of f integrated across d. So let's set up this computation. So given a parameterization, how do we do this scalar line integral? Well, we integrate from a to b, the bounds of the parameter, f of r of t dot n, where here n could also change as r of t changes. So that's the integrand f dot n evaluated along the parameterization and then times the speed of the parameterization dt. So all I've done here is take this kind of symbolically written scalar line integral and convert it into computational form using the parameterization. I don't actually need to try to do this composition f of r, so let me just replace that with p and q, where the idea is p and q are being evaluated along the parameterization. 
And then for the unit normal n, I'm going to bring in that form we mentioned. So if our parametric curve r of t is called x of t, y of t, so x component function, y component function, its velocity vector would be x prime of t, y prime of t. We flip it, negate the second one, divide by the speed. That's our way of writing down an explicit computation for that unit normal vector n. And then times the speed dt, this is great because those speeds cancel. So now we have a dot product. So if I expand that, we're gonna integrate from a to b, the bounds of the parameter, p times y prime of t dt minus q times x prime of t dt. Now I'm gonna pass from this kind of parametric computational form back to symbolic form. And how I'm gonna do that is I'm going to recognize that y prime of t dt is what we can call as the differential dy. And x prime of t dt is what we call dx. We, we mentioned this form in the lecture on Green's theorem for circulation. The idea is that the differential d vector r can be written in component form as dx dy, where dx is x prime of t dt, dy is y prime of t dt. You can check when we do our, our vector line integrals and we dot dr, what we end up doing is dotting x prime comma y prime dt. Okay, so now back here, I'm going to replace y prime of t dt with dy, x prime of t dt with dx. Okay, so now I'm passing back to a sort of symbolic form. This time it's a vector line integral where the vector field can be written as negative q comma p dot dr. In other words, it's negative q dx plus p dy. So that factors, if you will, via a dot product into negative q p dot dx dy or dot dr. But now we're integrating this vector line integral around the boundary of a region. Green's theorem for circulation allows us to say that the circulation of this vector field, negative qp around this closed curve c, enclosing the region d, can be computed by taking the 2D scalar curl of that vector field and double integrating that across d. But now if we do that 2D scalar curl, it's ddx of the second component minus ddy of the first component, so that's actually gonna give us p sub x minus negative q sub y. That's p sub x plus q sub y, that's actually the divergence of f. Okay, so this is just an illustration to show that Green's theorem from circulation allows us to derive the form for Green's theorem for flux. This could be fun to try to rederive on your own if you feel comfortable with all of this differential notation and passing back and forth between the somewhat symbolic looking representation for these vector line integrals, scalar line integrals, to the computational form that uses the parametrization. Okay, so you can try that on your own if you'd like. Thank you for your attention.